Welcome everybody to the new fly fisher. I'm your host Colin McEwen. In today's show we're going to be talking about frogs, leopard frogs, bullfrogs, and how frogs are an important part of ecosystems throughout Canada and the United States. We're going to be talking about how frogs are an important pattern for you to use for both bass, pike, and trout. We're also going to be talking about Frog Watch, a very interesting and unique program started here in Canada which is spread down in the United States that is trying to chart why amphibians as a whole are going down in population. It's going to be a fascinating show. I think you're going to really enjoy this. Stay with us. The new fly fisher is sponsored by the Atlantic Salmon Federation Bank of Montreal MasterCard, Ducks Unlimited, Canada's conservation company, Teton Fly Reels, Hodgman Outdoor Products. Frogs and toads are an integral part of ecosystems on most rivers and lakes in North America. They help reduce the number of insects present and provide an important link in the food chain of an ecosystem. Prudent anglers will add frog patterns to their arsenal of flies because at certain times of the year, they are particularly effective means of taking large fish, both warm water and cold water species. Noted author and guide, Ian James, has recognized the importance of frogs to large predatory fish and has developed a deadly pattern to simulate them. I usually find that um, throughout the summer, uh, you start out with a small frog pattern because the, the fish, smallmouth, brown trout, even rainbows, pickerel, pike, muskie, they'll feed on the small baby frogs or the froglets. Uh, they'll even feed on tadpoles. So if you start out with a small frog pattern and then as the summer progresses make the fly a little bit larger until you go right into the fall. And we've also found that frog patterns will work on the Thames here right up until the leaves fall in the autumn and then the frogs disappear they bury themselves down into the mud and uh, basically that's you you finish with them until the following spring when they come back out again um, most people fish frog patterns far too quickly if you watch a frog swimming they'll go tug tug glide tug tug glide it's the same with the fly tug it let all the circles disappear and then tug it again. And you'll usually find that's when the fish will take the fly. Very seldom will they take it when you're actually tugging it, but they'll take it as soon as it stops. So tug, tug, let the rings disappear completely. And as you tug it the second time or the third time, that's when they'll come up and take it. Surface flies work best in low light conditions. So first thing in the morning or in the evening. Or if it's cloudy, you can fish surface flies all day long. Bright sunlight will drive the fish down deep. They will not come up for a surface fly. If they've been feeding on frogs to their heart's content and the sun comes up, the cloud disappears, don't fish a surface fly. They won't come up to take it. When you're fishing frog patterns, the best thing to do is fish the shadows. Any kind of a, a shadow, throw it in, tug, 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 the fish will see it, they'll come up and take it. If you're fishing for brown trout or even uh, speckled trout with a frog pattern, same thing applies. Fish them in the morning, fish the green ones. As soon as the sun comes up, as soon as the sun goes basically above the tree line and it hits the river full out, then 
take the frog fly off and switch to a subsurface fly, like a tadpole. And then in the evening, as soon as the sun falls back below the tree level, or it gets cloudy, fish a surface frog again, and it'll be a fish. And it doesn't really matter if you're fishing for a speckled trout up in Labrador, or big rainbows, or big brown trout, or even lake run salmon, you'll come up and whack a frog pattern as well. Um, you don't get a lot of salmon out in Lake Ontario feeding on frogs, but I think it just really cheeses them off, and that's why they come up and take it. Um, I've found that pickerel will take them as well, but pickerel aren't very effective at taking frog flies. They'll smack at it a couple of times and almost drown it, and then they'll come up and take it. Another key thing to fishing frog patterns is to really fish them tight to the bank if you're in a river or along a current break, or a back eddy, or some place that you would see a frog just kind of sitting there relaxing and maybe getting a suntan. That's where you want to throw a frog fly. In ponds, it's very simple. Throw it around the edge of the weed beds. Both, that's where the fish will sit. In a river, it's a little bit different. You really have to look, and you usually find them in the slower pockets. I mean, here, the water's only inches deep. And you think, I wouldn't want to fish a frog there, but you should. Because quite often in the evening, when the sun starts to fall below the tree line, the big bass or the pike, even the pickerel, will come right into to, to water that's only inches deep to chase frogs. Frogs start out at the edge and then they go to the middle of the river. There's no point in taking a frog pattern and chucking it right into the middle of the river and expecting a fish to come up to it. The best thing you can do is bounce it right off the stones, right off the bank, right off the, the vegetation at the side and let it go plop. And when it goes plop, the fish will hear it, they'll turn around and they'll take it. The first thing I got taught when I was a child fly fishing was get on top of the fly. As soon as the fly hits the water, you're fishing. And that's very, very important with frog patterns. Again, the key to it, throw them in at the bank, let them drift out to the current breaks. Very, very rarely will you see a frog sitting in the fast water in the middle of a river. They're dead meat. Slow water at the side, maybe they're in there chasing bugs, I'm not sure. Maybe they're trying to get away from something chasing them on the shoreline. Think about the number of frogs you actually physically see in a river on a daily basis. It's not a lot. They're a big, chunky, meaty mouthful. Fish love them. If you're going bass fishing, if you're going brown trout fishing, take a frog pattern. Stephen's green frog. Absolutely amazing fly pattern. I wish I could say I truly invented it. I didn't. All I did was uh, change a few things that Stefan had come up with. It's a very simple fly. It's a very effective fly. And if you're going out for smallmouth or pickerel, you're completely wasting your time if you don't have one of these frog flies. When fishing using frog patterns, the best time of the day to use them is generally in the early morning or when the sun is falling in the late afternoon. Frogs are usually the most active at these times and large predatory fish will often come into the shallows in search of prey such as amphibians at this time. Late one summer afternoon, I joined John Huff, who is the owner of Brightwater Fly Shop, on Lac La Peche in Quebec to fly fish for both largemouth and smallmouth bass using frog patterns. John had some good advice about how to use these patterns and where to search for large, cruising, predatory bass. This is the frog pattern with the, uh, the legs that move. So this, this should not only push water, but really impart some realistic action. Rubber, uh, rubber legs up front. I haven't a chance, had a chance to fish with this pattern, but I'm really looking forward to it. Sometimes if you, I've been in situations before where you cast out a fly like this, that's, uh, that's making a commotion on the surface. And you see the bass, they'll move along with it, suspended, say, three or four inches right below it. And it, they'll just follow it, keep it, in, keep it in range. And then maybe it's just some little motion or it's, they think it, it might escape. Then they go for it and take it. One of the most exciting aspects about using frog patterns on the surface is the often violent surface takes that are induced. Usually I use barbless hooks for most of my fly fishing. However, when fishing for bass, I like to use a barbed hook because of the number of jumps they usually make 
and the fact that barb does little harm to them in comparison to other species such as brook trout. Use of a barbed hook will greatly reduce your losses when fly fishing for bass. That's a nice way to start the evening. He was still got lots of uh, life left in him. He's had about two and a half pounds. Three I'd say that's decent two and a half pound one. What are you doing? Because you've got a cone-faced uh, fly there? Yeah, I've got a, uh, a hard-body popper. It really pushes a lot of water. Mm -hmm. and so it you know, sends the kinds of sounds that we, you know, we think will attract fish. And actually, I just had a pretty good rise to it there. But, uh, you know, just landing on the water. Oh, got one. That, that fly's going to do pretty good. See that? I just paused it yeah. in between. We were chatting, and this guy came up and took it. That's, that's a little guy. I hate to say it, it's froggy of death's the fly tonight. It is. Oh, oh, that's a little bigger than I thought. That, that's a nice fish. I've seen a lot of largemouth. Yeah. You got a lot of smallmouth you said in here, eh? As well? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's get you in. I just coughed up a crayfish. Okay. You want to bring him to me? No, I can get him. Thanks, John. Oh, it's a smallmouth. Is it? Yeah, it's a nice size smallmouth, actually. Yeah. Look at that. Beautiful. Go. Nice, go on. That's for smallmouth. Frogs are an important part of ecosystems, and we all welcome their chorus of songs in the early evening as we cast to a late day hatch. Unfortunately, amphibians of all types are dropping dramatically in numbers throughout North America, and this has scientists and biologists alarmed. However, we can all make a difference by assisting the scientific community by getting involved in a unique program started by Environment Canada and the Canadian Nature Federation called Frog Watch. Danielle Bateman from the Canadian Nature Federation explains what the program is all about and how we can get involved. The Frog Watch program was started by the Canadian Nature Federation and Environment Canada's Ecological Monitoring and Assessment Network, um, building on some existing provincial programs in response to concern about amphibian declines throughout Canada. Uh, the aim of the program is to engage citizens in monitoring frog populations on behalf of scientists. The appeal of the program is that they encourage people to learn about the environment while gathering the information needed to protect it. It's prohibitively expensive to send researchers out in the field to monitor throughout the country. And using Frog Watch, Canadians of all ages can help contribute in discovering how and, more importantly, why natural ecosystems are changing. Frogs are considered our modern-day canaries in the coal mine. They're our early warning system that something is wrong in the environment. Due to a number of physical and morphological characteristics, they're more susceptible to environmental change and chemical contamination. When there's something wrong with them, it's an indication to us that there's something wrong in the environment, something we should be concerned about. Due to their life history being um, both in water and on land, they're susceptible to changes in both ecosystems. And because they breathe through their skin, they're more susceptible to um, toxicants in the environment in the water. The frog watch season can start as early as March with the wood frogs and will go right up until June and July with the bullfrogs. Our most common sighting has been the um, American toad. Most of our participants are from Ontario and that's the main toad that's found in Ontario. Uh, the other common species that people have 
have reported is the uh, spring peeper. And most people have never even seen a spring peeper. It's the call that people hear mostly with that species. Um, in the west, there's a number of species that we're concerned about. The northern leopard frog was once one of the most abundant species in the western provinces, BC and Alberta, and now some populations are even listed as endangered. So there's quite a concern with that species. The uh, Oregon spotted frog out in British Columbia is, has the unfortunate distinction of being Canada's most endangered amphibian. There's only about 350 individuals left, I think, in Canada, and uh, scientists are currently tracking them with radio transmitters to learn about their population movements and learn more about the species. In the east, the Fowler's toad is quite rare down near Lake Erie, and also the northern cricket frog down near Pelee Island is quite rare. hasn't been sighted in a couple of decades now, so there's concern about that one especially. People can get involved in the Frog Watch program if it's in their backyard, at their cottage, anytime they're out in the natural environment near the water. Young or old, there's no previous knowledge level required, whether you're a fly fisher or a naturalist. You can help contribute in discovering how and more importantly why natural ecosystems are changing. What people really like about the program is that it encourages them to learn about the environment while gathering the information needed to protect it. Canadians of all knowledge levels and ages can get involved in the program. We start people out with our poster, which serves as an ID guide and a field guide for people. It's got life-size color pictures of all the frogs and toads found in their area. And on the back, it's got a lot of background information and everything people need to know about to participate. It's got the toll-free telephone line where you can call in to hear the frog species calls using your provincial access code. People really like that part of the program. It's really neat to hear those frog calls. You can call us at the Canadian Nature Federation at 1-800-267-4088 to order a copy of the poster. You can also contact us um, through our website at www.cnf.ca and you can also find out background information uh, about the program on the website. You can also hear the frog species calls there and you can contact us to sign up as a volunteer and get your copy of the poster there as well. When using frog patterns on rivers or streams, the places to cast should include visible structures such as fallen trees, large boulders, current breaks near shore or undercut banks, and the heads and tails of pools and other locations that large fish will use to hold in. Generally, you will not see frogs casually swimming along in many of these areas. However, I have on occasion seen a frog caught in a strong current, frantically swimming with all its might for shore. Most major predators are opportunistic feeders and will quickly pounce on a hapless frog caught in this circumstance. Unlike many surface patterns, such as traditional dry flies, you generally Badly. must impart some action on the frog pattern in order to make them effective. If we look at how a frog swims, we can see that there is a relatively common action. Generally, they'll make two to three kicking motions followed by a gliding period. Usually, the strikes will occur during the glide or pause period. This animation gives a good representation of what a fish sees on the surface when a frog is swimming past. We need to replicate these actions with our retrieves in order to make fish strike. Oh! <laughs> That's the price you pay for barbless. There is essentially three retrieves I commonly use. The first thing to do is make a cast which plops the frog pattern down soundly on the surface. I wait for all the water rings to dissipate and I give the frog a slight jerk. Often this is when a strike will occur. The rest of the retrieve will be made of short pulls with long pauses. The second and most effective retrieve is when I again cast and plop a frog pattern down, let it rest for a moment, and then begin swimming it back with short and steady pulls. Usually there'll be two to three pulls followed by a pause of three to five seconds for the glide. Again, strikes will usually occur on the glide or pause segment of the retrieve. The last retrieve I use is what I can only refer to as the, oh my goodness, I'm in the wrong place and I better get out of here quick. In this retrieve, you quickly and steadily strip the frog pattern back, perhaps even accelerating the retrieve near the end. 
Large predatory fish will follow just underneath, and a little kick of acceleration will incite them to strike. The key is experimentation, to find both where the fish are holding and how active they are. Beautiful fish. <laughs> well, let's let him go. Thank you, sir. Oh, one last splash, eh? <laughs> as you could see in today's show, frog patterns and frogs as a whole are an important part of ecosystems throughout Canada and the United States. If you learn more about frogs, you'll greatly enhance your outdoor experience as well as increase your chances of catching different types of species such as bass, trout, and northern pike. I strongly recommend you get involved in the Frog Watch program wherever you are in Canada or the United States, as a collection of data is so important to scientists who are trying to understand why amphibians are going down in population. To learn more about this show or more about our series, please visit us on the World Wide Web at www.thenewflyfisher.com. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. The New Fly Fisher is sponsored by the Atlantic Salmon Federation Bank of Montreal MasterCard, Ducks Unlimited, Canada's conservation company, Teton Fly Reels, Hodgman Outdoor Products.